Introducing the newest and most requested course from Foundry Academy, Intro to Hashboard Diagnosis and Repair, offered by the same experts who provide top technical training for mining technicians in the U.S. This essential academy course offered by Foundry will take place in Rochester, New York from June 26th through the 30th, 2023. With a strong focus on mastering micro-soldering basics, Foundry's dedicated instructors possess years of ASIC hardware experience and will guide you through each step of the process. They'll ensure that you gain the confidence and skills required to undertake basic repair jobs and keep your operation healthy and hashing. Register today at foundryacademy.com. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. We've got a news roundup for our listeners this week. Matt, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Will. Thanks for having me back. Okay, so we're going to talk about Intel this week discontinuing its ASIC chip lineup. Then we're going to move over to Solana, which is now touting some more ESG benefits. We always love that. We're going to talk about Coinbase and the SEC and Gary Gensler's big day on Capitol Hill and finish up with Unchained Capital raising a decent amount of money. We'll start off with this Intel news. Intel has now made it public that they're not going to continue producing the block scale ASIC chip. They first announced that they were going to produce Bitcoin ASICs chips in, I believe, April of 2022. So about a year ago, calendar wise. And they've already closed up shop. Uh, according to the sources I have who have been like working on this or working with Intel, the reason is that they produce a ton of these chips. There was a glut of supply, and now there's no reason to continue making them if no one is going to continue buying them. Uh, Hive is, of course, one of the purchasers of these chips, and they have already made their Hive miner that has been deployed. We don't have a lot of details on like the efficiency of the machine or the terahash output, but we do know they have over 5,000 of those deployed. There's a few other miners who did purchase them, but I don't think anything really happened with it. So like Grid or Argo, two firms that seemingly we didn't get a lot of updates on what happened with their allocations from Intel. But looks like Intel is trimming up a little bit, focusing on other things. Doesn't necessarily mean they like don't like Bitcoin or Bitcoin mining, but they're focusing on other stuff right now. Your take? I don't love this news. I mean, the but like potentially the greatest centralization point if you want to really go layers deep in uh Bitcoin in general is probably the market share breakdown in number of ASIC manufacturers. Um, and geographically, there's we had one in the United States and in Intel. It would have been kind of nice. I was I was kind of rooting for them. Um, it seems like they're still gonna uh, accept orders until October 23 is what the the article claims. Um, and they're still gonna uh, basically service shipments through April 24. So it's not like the miners that were buying these rigs um, are just being cut uh, cold turkey. So I mean that's good for them to honoring all their contracts and et cetera. But like for, for Bitcoin in general and for the mining space, I was hoping to have like another prominent, reliable, uh, professional manufacturing in, in Intel. Um, and I hope they come back. I hope they come back and do more Bitcoin. Um, but it seems like it's over for now. All right, B, we'll see you again next cycle, Intel. Okay, let's go over to Solana land. We have a nice article from Coindesk. Our friend Danny Nelson headline reads, Solana's annual carbon footprint equals eight flights from London to New York with the subheader, a real, a new real-time dashboard set up by the Solana Foundation purporting to show how relatively little carbon the smart contract platform is emitting at a time when the energy usage of Bitcoin and other blockchains is under scrutiny. It goes on to discuss about how the Solana server network, which is basically a proof of stake system, but has some other like widgets and gizmos that we don't really need to go into here doesn't use that much energy uh, and doesn't use that much carbon along that line of logic. It's about 1,300 metric tons, which is only a few flights between London and New York. Uh, the obvious thing that they're pointing at here is a competing chain, Bitcoin. This is like a pretty classic gimmick by a lot of altcoins out there where they sort of like put Bitcoin over here and what people don't like about Bitcoin and then their network on the other side, they make a little dashboard. And whenever like the, the journalist comes to them is like, hey, we want to talk about your gear chain and its carbon intensity. They just point to their website and be like, hey, we're actually not using that much. Go talk to the Bitcoin people. Uh, your thoughts on it? Maybe they're not using that much because their network downtime is so high all the time. Uh, oh, 
No, I'm basically kidding. Uh, but yeah, no, this is a nothing burger of a story. Proof of stake chain is not using a lot of energy emitting carbon. Shocker, right? Um, <laughs> I don't know. They're just like, it's just like a look at me over here kind of marketing ploy and whatever, meaningless to me. Sorry. Yeah. I do think it points towards like the marketing problems within cryptocurrency where everyone seems to go after each other. And no one seems to recognize that they're all in the same boat together. You go after Bitcoin, well, guess what? You have a problem with your own chain as well uh, because all these things inherently are tied to each other in economic sense. It's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, let's go over to the next story. Crypto exchange Coinbase receives a license to operate in Bermuda. Uh, this came out, I believe, on a Wednesday. Coinbase is the largest exchange in the U.S. and the, one of the second, like the second largest exchange in the world or uh, up there, I should say. Um, in terms of volume, and they're going international. Now, historically, there's sort of been like two comparisons here, right? Binance, which has been international, not been focused on the U.S., besides its U.S. arm, Binance U.S., which is relatively small uh, compared to some other exchanges. And there's been the Coinbase way, which is like, let's just focus on the U.S., but to be regulatorily compliant, and let's get everything that we need to here. Uh, but there's been pressure on both sides. Binance has been forced to jurisdiction hop all over the globe. Coinbase has been looking for licenses, but they're still getting pressured from Washington, D.C., specifically the Biden administration's uh, SEC and Gary Gensler. And I think Coinbase has basically had enough of it. And so they're deciding, like, you know, maybe we will just do an international arm specifically for derivatives trading. Uh, they Coinbase right now really only operates Spot and like a bunch of other products, product services around that. Derivatives could dwarf that by a lot. Typically, derivatives markets do dwarf Spot. So... It's not surprising that they would open it up that way and that they'd move it offshore so they don't have to deal with any of the regulatory concerns because a lot of these regulatory agencies in the U.S. do not like uh, derivatives for any sort of crypto product that's normally slapped down. Any thoughts on that before we play this little video of, of Gary Gensler on Capitol Hill? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like the U.S. regulators are kind of like red in the face, embarrassed from the FTX fallout, and they're kind of doing a lot of enforcement actions against all sorts of different kind of crypto entities, but specifically they've gone after exchanges. Uh, Coinbase is bearing the brunt of that, and I think uh, they're basically hedging their bets. Like, uh, And interesting that you say they're uh, building out derivatives because there's a certain amount of market share that was lost from, from FTX. Uh, basically going down right and so it's there's open for uh, for competition and that'd be honestly pretty good for the space Binance is dominating um volumes and so to have another international kind of exchange uh that's available and reliable um would be a good thing i think in general um for like just market infrastructure i agree i agree with you uh for those interested in that line of conversation definitely go check out the latest podcast we did with kaiko research uh, Claire Vandali, who heads the research department over there. We talked about market structure, talked about how Binance is dominating markets, and we also talked about Bitcoin's price and how it might actually be in a pretty weak spot because there is not a ton of liquidity in the market. So definitely go check that one out. It interests out. you. Definitely good podcast. Kaiko Research is a great team. Uh, okay, so at the same time that this Coinbase news came out, Gary Gensler went to Capitol Hill and he got grilled by a few politicians that was earlier in this week of course the linkage here is that coinbase has recently received a wells notice which is essentially an intention to sue an institution this institution being coinbase by the sec uh so gary gensler coinbase all these people sort of tied up this week let's take a look at this video uh back in 2018 then sec corporation finance director bill Hinman, Hinman uh, stated that he believed Ether was not a security. Uh, last month, CFTC Chair uh, Benham expressed his view that Ether is a commodity. Uh, the State Attorney General of New York asserted in a court filing last month that Ether is a security. Clearly, an asset cannot be both a commodity and a security. Do you agree? Um, I. I Actually, all securities are commodity under the Commodity and Exchange Act. It's that we are excluded commodities. But I would agree that a security cannot be also an excluded commodity and an included commodity. I'm sorry, Chair, just to talk about the Commodity Exchange Act more precisely. 
Okay, so do you recognize, uh, how would you categorize ether then? Look, I think that the general sweep of what Congress did, not just in the 30s, but uh, as amended. I'm asking here, you, sitting in your chair yeah. now to make an assessment under the laws as exist, is ether a commodity or a security? Without speaking to anyone. I know you've okay, repeatedly said that you're not going to speak to facts. one, except you've spoken to one, Bitcoin. So I'm asking you to speak to a second one, the lar second largest market cap here. And speaking to the tokens, there's 10 to 12,000. If there's a group of entrepreneurs in I'm the middle, asking about the one. public is anticipating a profit based on the- I'm asking a specific question, Chair Gensler. I said this in private. This should be no shock to you. I'm asking this question. Is, it an e is ether a commodity? Or security. And again, it depends on the facts and the law. And if there's a group of individuals, I'm asking you about the, the facts middle. and the law sitting in your seat and the judgment you are making. And so, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I think you you would not want me to prejudge because I'm also. But you have prejudged on this. You've taken you've taken 50 enforcement actions. We're finding out as we go, as you file suit, as people get Wells notices on what is a security in your view in your agency's view. I'm asking you a very simple question about the second largest digital asset. What is your view? And my view is, is if there's a group of individuals in the middle, middle that the public is anticipating All right, so let me just ask a second question then. Do you think it serves the market for an object to be, to be viewed by the commodities regulator as a commodity and the securities regulator to be viewed as a security? Do you think that provides uh, safety and soundness for, for, for the product? Do you think it provides consumer protection? Do you, see, do you think it serves the value of innovation? I think no should be a very simple answer for you here. I think that uncertainty is bad, is it not? And I think that Congress has said that there's one agency, the Securities and Exchange Commission, under this committee. And you won't answer my question, and you're the head of that agency. So give me a break. Come on. I'm answering it in the generic because you would not want me to speak about any one set of facts and circumstance. Okay, so, but you've already spoken. Have you said anything about Bitcoin? Uh, the, the, my predecessors and the agency itself has spoken to them. Okay, but you're not willing to do the same about Ether. I okay, so let me just step back. There's a lack of clarity here in the marketplace. Can you at least agree to that? I think that the clarity is there. The law is clear. All that right. There's a group so let, of let me let me be let me be explicit about this. The market doesn't see it. Your regulatory actions and the CFTC's regulatory actions say that there's a great deal of uncertainty here. How many chairmen wear bow ties to these things? I kind of like the point. Um. Yeah. What a badgering. I I loved it honestly. Like put some pressures, but the SEC's in a difficult. Uh, position because I think they have to like go off of president precedent that's like not necessarily really applicable um, and they don't have a lot of tools and they kind of just go in with enforcement which I'm not trying to defend them and say that that's a good practice um, but clearly they don't know what to do interestingly also I think today or yesterday um, MICA which is like markets in uh crypto assets, I think, or so something similar to that uh, in the EU um, was like approved. It's going to be like uh, 18 month implementation, but there's like clarity in the EU now. We still do not know what's happening in the United States. It's like kind of a gloomy look. If you're Coinbase, why not go look for somewhere else? Like if I was down, what do you think? Will? Yeah. No, it's frustrating. I think that two, three minute back and forth between Representative Patrick McHenry of North Carolina and his nice bow tie and Garrett Gensler, the chairman of the SEC, sort of encapsulated the confusion in the market, right? Garrett Gensler and the SEC seem to think that it's okay to keep ruling by enforcement, taking down projects and exchanges without giving ample clarity on what is going to be uh, deemed security and what is not. And then Congress is vying for more information, more clarity, and then market participants are caught in the middle. And for those out there, I think, who are thinking like, oh, I'm Bitcoin only and I don't really care about anything else like this. Well, right now it does matter because there's a lot of people building projects on other things that they're thinking are not a security. And it's a lot, huge misallocation capital if the government comes back and says, these are a security you need to register. That will shut down a ton of projects that otherwise would just not be built and that will put the industry farther back. Uh, so hopefully there is some clarity in the future, but at the very least, a very nice grilling. Okay, last topic. 
actually going to hand this one over to you very quickly. Bitcoin Financial Services firm Unchained Capital raises $60 million. Series B funding comes about five months after the company cut 15% of its staff and made the pressures of the prolonged crypto bear market. It's according to Coindesk on April 18th. I know you work at their offices, so you have to give them a, a good hit here. What's your thoughts on this? I work in the Bitcoin Commons, but um, yeah, shout out uh, the Unchain for their raise. Um, they basically, for those unfamiliar, they do Bitcoin native financial services. So they're one of those companies that um, is kind of intimately uh, following the the technology aspects of Bitcoin and kind of bridging it to actual products and services uh, and offering it to people. So. I want to see more companies like Unchained. I'm glad they're they're growing and they're raising, um, and they're going to continue to offer uh, these kinds of products. I think most popularly they do um, multi sig custody, uh, where like you know you have a key um, and they have a key, and you you might have two keys and give one to um, someone that you trust, and kind of whenever you want them to to sign, um, it's kind of like a more fault tolerant way of doing custody in that sort of collaborative sense. That's probably their most popular, but they th they also do, I believe, like uh, Bitcoin backed lending. So you can kind of get dollar liquidity. You don't have to liquidate your Bitcoin. Uh, and I think the escrow is probably also in a multi sig. But uh, yeah, good on Unchained. Uh, would like to see more financial services companies that actually use uh, Bitcoin technology, um, settle on chain, et cetera, et cetera. I dig it. I don't understand a lot about that market. And like, I've listened to some stuff, I've listened to the Letting guys. Uh, it's interesting the fact that you can use like a key setup in order to do some sort of like trustless lending. I think that's important, especially in the wake of like the very poor trusting set or poor lending practices that we saw unravel over the last two years. It's important to have those sort of services. My question with it is like, do you get very good capital efficiency? And I don't know if that's the case or not. It's an open question that I have to investigate. Yeah, and there's a lot of market dynamics to that. I think what you said though is is key in that you basically get the assurance that they are not rehypothecating your collateral that you posted, right? Because you basically can see where it is on chain as it is literal Bitcoin. That is the advantage yeah. of using Bitcoin as collateral. That's one of the beautiful things about DeFi. I will say that uh, people might not like that, but the ability to see collateral where it's going to what's it's doing even if it's like meaningless useless stuff uh, which a lot of it is at this moment it is uh better okay we will wrap up there we will see everyone next week matt and i are both at consensus at least i will be there physically i don't know if matt's going to be here. i'll be there okay we're both there so if you are listening to the podcast please come and say hi we'd love to catch up with you talk about the show or what else you like in bitcoin bitcoin mining Apologies, I'll have Bitcoin mining topics today, but there was not a lot of news. There was a few smaller deals, but Strano V2, it's progressing. Check it out. Look it up. Myers, if you want to test it, the job negotiator version is out. I'm sneaking that in. Okay. That was good. I said meh before because I feel like there's always like incremental news on that. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're at consensus next week. And then Matt and I will be recording in person as well, which will be fun. Okay, we'll see you guys again. Bye. Cheers.